Hello and welcome. I'm Wei, and today I've got something really exciting to share with you. RF inversion. I use it to create an amazing comfier workflow that can do things I never imagined. You can download the workflow for free. I'll put the link in the description below. When you combine it with Alimama's Turbo LoRa, generating images with Flux becomes super fast. It only takes 8 steps to generate a picture. Let's dive in and see what it can do. The first thing I want to show you is called Semantic Style Transfer. If you haven't heard of it before, don't worry. Let's look at two images. On the left, I uploaded a reference image of a woman in traditional clothing in Comfy UI. On the right is the image generated by this workflow. You can see that the pose and the look are really similar. And here's the cool part. I didn't use IP adapter or control net to make this happen. It's all thanks to the control capabilities of RF inversion combined with the prompts we used. Here's another example. On the left is the reference image I uploaded, a cat in a playful pose. On the right, the same woman successfully mimics the cat's pose. This kind of pose imitation isn't possible with ControlNet open pose. But with this workflow, you can easily do it. You're not limited to realistic styles either. You can transform manga, illustration, or painting styles too. For example, I found the reference image on the left on the Meet Library site, which shows styles you can achieve in Meet Journey. Using the workflow, I generated an image based on that reference and the style transferred perfectly. You can also adjust parameters in the workflow to further control how the style is applied. I generated 70 images using different parameters. You'll see that it starts with a realistic style, then shifts into an illustration, and eventually migrates all the four square compositions from the reference image. You can also use the workflow to enhance lighting effects. All you need is a reference image. Take a look at the picture on the left. I added light to it with Photoshop, but the effect looks unnatural. After running it through the workflow, the lighting becomes much more natural, and the face stays consistent. The skin texture looks smoother, and even the hair looks better. This workflow doesn't just transfer style, it can also copy light, color, and composition at the same time. Take a look at these two images. Notice how the lighting, color, and the composition match perfectly. I also tried applying a Gaussian blur to the reference image inside the workflow, which gave it a soft focus effect similar to what you'd see in photography. And beyond all that, it can even upscale low quality images and transform them into high quality ones. You might have noticed that most of the women in my generated images looked like the same person. That's because this workflow lets you use a face reference image. For my examples, I use the same face in multiple images to keep things consistent. And the best part, you don't need to install ControlNet or IP adapter models to get started with this workflow. It's really easy to set up. All of this is made possible thanks to the author of the Comfort UI Flux Tapos project on GitHub, known as LockTD. If you find this workflow useful, be sure to give the project a star on GitHub to support the creator. Now, before you start using this workflow, you need to make sure all the required nodes are installed. If you drag the workflow into Comfort UI and notice that any nodes are missing, just open the Comfort UI Manager to install them. There's also a node for pull ID that you might want to install. Instructions for that are available on its GitHub page, and I'll include the link below. You also need to download Alimama's Turbo LoRa. It's essential for fast image generation. I recommend renaming it to something like Flux Turbo Alpha and placing it in the LoRa folder for easy access. It's divided into four main groups. On the left, you have the basic settings, this is where you upload reference images, set the size, enter your prompts, and specify the model path. In the upper right is the unsampling node group, which processes the reference image to generate the noise image in latent space. Below that, we have the pull ID node group. This part helps the workflow understand what the person in the reference image looks like. If you are not working with portraits, you can bypass these groups. Finally, the bottom node group resembles the noise image to generate the final image. Because this workflow is so flexible, 
it might take a little experimenting to get the results you want. Let's take a closer look at each section and how to use it effectively. The first step is to upload a reference image and this is probably the most important part. You need to decide what you want to use as your reference. Choose an image that closely matches the effect you are aiming for. For example, when I generated the image on the right, I used the reference image on the left, which is why the faces look so similar. If what you don't want is prominent in a reference image, it's better to pick a different image. Let's say the image you upload is a hard body portrait and you want to generate a full body portrait. In that case, it's best to find a full body reference image. You can also open the hard body image to extend it into a full body version and then use that as a reference. If there are details in the reference image that you don't need, no worries. You can tweak those using prompts later. And if you want everything to be just right from the start, you can also impend parts of the reference image beforehand to modify specific areas. Right next to the reference image node, there is an image flip node. I use it to flip the reference image horizontally to get the composition I wanted. You can also use other nodes to adjust color or modify the image further. Below that, you will see the nodes for prompts. But before we get into how to write them, it's important to first understand how unsampling and sampling work. This will help you use the prompts more effectively. So, I'll save that explanation for the end in the checkpoint and LoRa setup. I used the flex-based photorealistic model to make the generated scheme look more realistic. The unsampling group processes the reference image through RF inversion, creating a noise image. From there, you can use prompts to guide the workflow in generating your final image. Notice the steps parameter in the basic scheduler. Since I'm using Turbo Alpha LoRa, I only need 8 steps. But if you're aiming for the highest quality and don't mind waiting a bit longer, you can skip LoRa and increase the number of steps to 28 or more. Just make sure the step settings in the scheduler match across both the unsampling and the resampling nodes group below. Now let's talk about the Flux ID node group. If you're not familiar with it, I recommend checking out some related videos to learn more. The most important part of this workflow is the bottom nodes group. This is where small changes in the parameters can have a big impact on your final result. The key parameters you are want to adjust are ETA and N step in the Flux Reverse ODE Sampler node. Now, how do these parameters work? Think of them like the parameters you'll find in the IP adapter. The ETA value acts like a weight, controlling how strongly the ODE sampler influences the image. The start step works like a starting point. It determines when the ODE sampler kicks in, and it's usually set to zero. The end step sets the point where the sampling process stops. Keep in mind that the range for this is 2 to 8. Going beyond that will cause an error. There's also the ETA train setting, which is similar to a weight type. It controls how ETA behaves throughout the sampling process. Whether it increases, decreases, or stays constant over time, this might sound a bit abstract, so let's look at a practical example to make it clearer. I generated a series of images using different values for ETA and the end step and made a chart to visualize the results. Along the top of the chart, you'll see the increasing ETA values. On the left side, you'll see the increasing end step values. As the ETA value increases, the image changes quite a lot. However, when the end step value increases, the changes aren't as dramatic. Let's zoom in and take a closer look. As ETA increases, you'll notice significant changes in color and the style of the skirt, as well as in the lighting and the composition. Now let's check out what happens with the end step adjustments. Aside from more noticeable shifts in lighting, the other changes are fairly subtle. This gives us an important insight. If we think of the adjustment process like sculpting, ETA works like a sledgehammer. It's used to carve out the overall shape with bold, decisive changes. On the other hand, end steps works like a sculpting knife. Once ETA has created the general outline, end step 
lets you refine the finer details. Using them in this sequence is a smart way to efficiently fine-tune your results. Alright, by now everyone should have a good understanding of the two parameters, ETA and NSTEP. Now let's take a look at the ETA trend parameter, which offers three options, linear decrease, linear increase, and constant. What we've talked about so far is linear decrease, which is the default option. In most cases, it works just fine. Now let's check out what happens with a linear increase. You will notice that the composition of the image stays mostly the same, but the biggest difference is in the lighting. If your main goal is to adjust the lighting, linear increase is a great option to use. Finally, let's take a look at the constant setting. With this option, ETA has the most influence, but the people or subjects in the image become less relevant. If your focus is on adjusting lighting, constant isn't the best choice since it shifts more control to other areas. Next, let's go back and talk about how to write prompts. The unsampling prompt is used for the unsampling node group in the upper right corner. It guides the unsampling process, working somewhat like the tagging process when training a LoRa. For now, we'll leave this blank to see how the workflow behaves without it. The sampling prompt is used for the sampling node group in the lower right corner. This is similar to the prompt you would use during a typical text-to-image generation process, as it directly guides the final output. Let's start by lowering the ETA a bit to reduce its influence. This will make it easier to see the effects of the prompt adjustments. Here we've set ETA to 0.75. This is the reference image we uploaded, and this is the image generated by the workflow. They still look quite similar, right? Now if we delete both prompts, here's what happens. Yeah, as you can see, there are some issues with her eyebrows and scarf. Let's try adding the prompts back into the sampling prompt node, one at a time. If we start by adding just black here to the sampling prompt, the eyebrows look fine. But when we add another prompt, neat scarf, we notice that the glasses have disappeared. So it seems we need to explicitly mention the glasses in the prompt as well. Now what if we add the same prompts to the unsampling prompt node too? Strangely, the result is worse. The glasses come out a bit crooked. This shows that the settings in the sampling prompt are much more important than those in the unsampling prompt. If you're unsure what to use for the unsampling prompt, it's perfectly fine to leave it blank and refine it later. Okay, that's all for this video. I hope you'll try out RF inversion and create some amazing effects with it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.